Welcome back to Dr. Bruce. Today we take you on a journey to that beautiful valley of Ojai in Southern California, a place I lived in my late 20s and early 30s. My house at the time was right next to the Krishnamurti Library, and back then, in 1990, the great philosopher J. Krishnamurti had just died, so I never got the chance to meet him. 23 years later, on a visit to Ojai, I met Jeffrey Harris, who had moved to Ojai in the mid-80s, drawn there by family roots, a desire to escape the matrix, and to sit under the teaching tree with J. Krishnamurti. At that time, Jeff started to develop a compound of buildings not far from where Krishnamurti taught, and when I met him by happenstance, he was just ready to inaugurate it with some kind of an event. What follows is the first Ojai Salon, where we will take you on another journey from our insectivore primate ancestors 90 million years ago, all the way up to the first flash of the total conscious manifesting of the universe in our own time. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> this is a first in a 25-year-long series of future visionary salons. Uh, my oldest, newest friend, Bruce Damer, uh, my newest, oldest friend, <laughs> Uh, I just happened to run into Bruce on the sidewalk a couple weeks ago in front of Rainbow <laughs> Bridge <laughs> and happened to recognize his photograph from the uh, Psychedelic Salon podcast page. It's a fabulous uh, resource for all things intelligentsia, uh, which Bruce is smack dab in the middle of. Um, somewhere between uh, Boulder Creek and Mars, I'm not sure where. <laughs> um, so yeah, stay tuned because uh, I'm, and I couldn't be happier that uh, Bruce is helping us at, very spontaneously. We decided a week ago that we were going to be here tonight. Spontaneous combustion. Yeah, and he was co so kind to you know extend his his presence here and his. Totally put me at ease because normally I'd have to go into a whole production mode and get all worked up about having to talk. And he said, let's just do it and see what happens. So this is the result of that, and I like it. So I come to you by way of Boulder Creek and Mars. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Bruce Damer, and I've been doing talks since the 80s on various things. But in the last four or five years, I've been branching out into doing talks the people really actually want to hear, <laughs> which is not about some technology or some thing like that, but about the human condition and the human future. And so here's a wild thing. If you actually think about life in the trees 90 million years BC, what we were, as a, this is the all primates, it's, it's all monkey slash primates, it's all things with binocular vision. We were, we were this big, we were the size of, of a thumb. We had the binocular vision and we had the hands and we had the feet. And so tiny, but we would, we would live in clumps, in balls, you know, probably in hollows and things like this, these little things that are looking out. And we would come out in the morning and we would suck dew from... This is pre-primate. This is the oh. first primate. This is, this is the, uh -huh. the dawn primate. Mm -hmm. Not like in 2001, this is the true dawn primate world. Was You would come away from your little ball of, of protected warming primatedom, monkeydom, and you'd come out and you would suck up droplets. And you would try to grab an insect, and an insect was a major kill. It was, you know, a, a dragonfly would have been too big for these to handle, because dragonflies actually in the Devonian were three three foot wingspans, because there were no bird, mammals, and things, and they were the, the, the big hunter before there was much in the, anim, in the mammal kingdom. So you would, you would have a hunt for insects, for your protein, but then for your, for your high, it was tree sap, sugary uh, tree sap. So you can imagine, this is what we are. We are protein-seeking and then high sugar-seeking Binocular vision, color vision, 
completely social but completely kind of nutso <laughs> and 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 that totally it. <laughs> we're, we're, we're threatened by everything because we're so small so we have to but you can imagine that the one male primate deciding it was going to sneak away from the group and go f and get that tree sap that it sees on the next branch and get totally drunk on it basically that's what happened and you, you can actually see insectivores or tree living things now that are like this and the dyna the dynamism of their interactions are just intense and that's us that's our root so we like burgers and shakes <laughs> yeah mcdonald's is heavy sugar and heavy fat. heavy sugar mm -hmm. heavy fat um and you know big wad of protein <laughs> yeah so and we like highs and we like chatter and because of our binocular vision well, for example, one of the key survival strategies of these, you know, 90 million year old relatives was snakes. So colored snake patterns moving, if you couldn't detect those, that's why we have color vision. Because you had to be able to pick those up because they were the number one killer. Of, so, yeah, well, I'll do this. The sap suckers. The sap suckers. So the, the snakes... <laughs> And the snake would just sit there and be like a branch, and it would move slightly, and there were, there were patterns on snakes. So we really got good at looking at pixelated patterns, color patterns. This is why we're totally addicted to these things. The screen, the glowing pixel on the screen, mesmerizes all primates. It mesmerizes orangutans. It works on rhesus monkeys. They're just total suckers because it's... It's evolved to see patterns that threaten it, like like. Snakes. Well, and now not only we're in control of that pattern, so we can change it at will, which is a dream come true. We're no longer yeah. fearing what it might do. We are actually controlling its behavior. Yeah, and which is exactly what a prey would. It's, it's the one thing that a prey can never do, which it longs to do, which is to be able to control its predator. To control its predator. Yeah. So the the snake is in a sense technology, it's media, it's the most seducing, because you can imagine the snakes also what they did with this patterning is they mesmerized the primates. If you'll notice how a snake hunts, often those patterns create just this stillness and, and, and almost mm -hmm. like an anesthesia and then the snake goes for it. And so technology is like the snake in a way. It's we just like, ah, and then we're consumed. Yeah, we're consumed by it. We're completely captured by it. So computer yeah. graphics and, you know, Pixar and all these things. Wow. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, how do you see the explosion of technology in this just last 20 years? Where do you see the origin of that? I did a whole study on this in about the year 2001, 2002. I said, I'm going to try to tell this whole bloody story. And in order to do that, I, I, I basically collected about 60 tons of computer hardware. <laughs> I have 500 working machines all the way from you know, the late 19th century up to the first digital computers in the 50s and 60s and the first microcomputers. And they're all... They're all in. Uh, we'll wait till the Sorry. snake is. Technology My phone is not been working, and all of a sudden it's doing that. God, no! I, I have okay. no control. This is chaos theory. <laughs> well, how you turn off a phone? Well, I guess I just have to. The turn matrix. It off. Yeah, the matrix just... is uh, ever present. So, so the strange. matrix is coming. So this, this BlackBerry. Or is it a Blackberry? No, this is a dumb phone. It's, it's a just dumb a, phone. It's just a phone. Oh, there's a cartoon that you would love, which is three panels. And on the first panel, there's this bunch of people walking around. And there's a guy. And he says, all these people have cell phones and I just still have a landline. And in the next panel, um, you know, all these people have like nice glowing. And he says, all these people have a smart smartphone and I just have this dumb phone. <laughs> And then last panel, there's these glowing balls around him, and he's walking along, and he says, oh, everyone's a pure energy being, and I still have this body. <laughs> <laughs> always, always late. But the Digibarn project, and if you go to digibarn.com, you can see it, was where I tackled this. 
said, I'm going to figure everything out. But in order to figure this out, I have to collect all the artifacts, get them working, contact all the original people who built them, <laughs> do events with them, capture their entire oral history, then build a site with 25,000 links by hand that link everything together. And I did this over 10 years. So this great project has resulted in a discovery, which is that a discovery that what we have built in the digital world is actually not that good. It's not, it's not very well engineered and it's actually doesn't have a lot of potential. It's very, very, it's very brittle and it's very limited. So just at the popular level or just in, just in even at the, even at the, even in the inner sort of like the highest manifestation of the technology. The highest, well, one of the things I did in order to do this research, you know, this inquiry is I went to a place in New Jersey, um, in the beautiful green hills of New Jersey called the Institute for Advanced Study. And I don't know if anyone's ever heard of this place, but mm -hmm. a, a department store magnet had a, made a fortune and a week before the crash of 1929, he sold his department store. Can you imagine the luck of this? It's amazing. <laughs> and then he took all this money and he, he endowed this guy named Flexner to create an institute for advanced study where pure science would happen without the burden of classrooms and laboratories. And then they went out and recruited Albert Einstein and all these amazing people that as the Nazis were scaring off Jewish scientists, they were scooping them up and putting them into little, you know, clapboard houses in Princeton, New Jersey, and they were walking and bicycling to this place and they built this beautiful full hall with the brick things. And I've been a visitor there a couple of times. And I would go and see um, Pete Hutt, who's a somewhat controversial member of the, they, they have members, there's like 20 members of this institute and seven or eight have Nobel Prizes. Mm -hmm. And the other guy that I go to see at this institute is named Freeman Dyson. And he's a complete character. He's a complete iconoclastic character. He's from World War II from the um, radar projects and a boffin of the highest order. So he helped with the, the war effort. And one of the things I wanted to do was I said, I want to go in with permission and help of archivists and I want to go through von Neumann's files. So I went through von Neumann's files nice. and von Neumann is the guy. So they brought out this box, <laughs> Robert awesome. Oppenheimer, electronic computer project. And this was the place where and these files contained the records of the first full computer that was, was made. And I know the British will hang me from the nearest gallows of saying this because they considered that they did it. But truthfully, in those green fields of New Jersey, they created the functional model, modern computer with, where you didn't have to put patch cords on the outside to set it up for a calculation. It had internal memory and internal little program instruction sets and you just push a button, load a bunch of cards and it would do it without, it would run this various card programs through and do things. It didn't have a screen, no mouse or keyboard. It had cathode ray tubes for memory. It looked like a hot rod. It had 40 of these things, 20 on either side and it would shoot beams at these tubes and, and light up spots, and before the stop, spots went away, it would be able to read them off and refresh them, and that was fast memory from the earliest television manufacturers at RCA. Crazy. And this thing was a hot rod, and it had 2,400 glass valves called you know, vacuum tubes in it, and it was a total hot rod. And they gave away the plans. They just gave away the design because they didn't want anyone to sue them. They didn't want to file patents and get involved in that, so they gave it for free. And then everybody started building Johnny von Neumann's computer. This is the, the head of the project. And then, you know, University of Illinois was working on it and everything. And, and so these iPhones and this voice recorder and even your phone has a von Neumann computer in it. And von Neumann was this Hungarian mathematician, one of the great minds of the 20th century. And before he died, he wrote something like, well, the computer we built at Princeton was only like a contingency. It was like just to get the thing to actually work and run something for a few minutes to do something. Uh -huh. And so we, we created this, this, and this, but this isn't necessarily the best design for a computer. We're stuck with that. 
even the world's most That's powerful. Weird. Yeah, we're still running von Neumann machine. And and why? It's because you could build things to run more and more payroll, more and more scientific data, and more and more games using these simple pipelines. So what a von Neumann computer does is it brings in its version of the world into a little thin narrow pipe and goes up and down and works on it and then releases it. So you get, you know, what you think of as a full-on World of Warcraft virtual world on the screen, but it's really this little pipe that's saying, I'll paint that and then I'll do this and then I'll, I'll show that character there and then I'll do this sound here. Nature isn't like that. So nature has all these properties that are totally undoable by computers. So nature would say, um, we don't do things this way. If nature tried to operate like a computer, it would have failed utterly. So computers actually can't do nature. Computers can't simulate nature at all, at all really. And nature is so much more powerful. Nature is so much more creative. And, and expressive than, than computers. So I discovered in this 10-year quest, I have Cray supercomputers. You know, I have, you know, bomb designing computers and, and, and they're really pathetic. All of them are so limited. So I switched in, at, in the year 2007 when I started the PhD, 2007, 2008, when I discovered how actually things work. I stopped going to all my artificial intelligence conferences. I stopped talking to all my friends who were in robotics and a life and I, I'd had it because they, they're under this conception that they're doing something powerful and they're not. They're really not because they're using an inferior tool. So when you actually sort of bring down the veil and decide to look at the reality, it's even wilder and crazier. So cut to the short, so at the end of 2011, when I finished the PhD and defended it, I was sitting on a, a park bench in Montpellier, France, at a conference on Origin of Life, and I was totally depressed because while my PhD had shown through computers simulating millions of atoms bouncing around, how complexification works, finding the wiggle, but it was apparent to me that computers were never going to simulate an Origin of Life event. We would never be able to use computers to solve how life started, which is the whole point of my PhD. So I defended that, but then I was like, oh, in, in my lifetime, we'll never see a laboratory or a simulation-based solution to showing, can you imagine you have a whole bunch of computers, great big molecular soup, and they simulate a pathway to life. So it's sort of a, a, sort of a decent attempt at trying to map something but in no way is capable of mimicking it. It can't and 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 because nature's got so much more dimension and, and dynamism nature just runs roughshod. Like for instance the the um, number of molecules in this glass that are moving around the entire world's computers put together in some creative way could not model this in real time and totally predictably could not. This is, this is out-computing everything we've ever built in computing. So the explosion of technology that Alex was asking about um, is uh, just sort of a slightly more sophisticated version of uh, Girls Gone Wild or something. You know, like, <laughs> kind uh, of, it kind of. <laughs> I mean, it's really nothing much more it's nothing than, in, than that. In uh, fact, although it seems like such a profound... No, it's hammers. Um, yeah, it's they're all just tools. It's just tools. In fact, what they're it not is is do anything in and of themselves. They're not going to do our eyes. That's right. They're they're absorbing our eyeballs. Yeah. Dissolving our eyeballs and our minds and things, but they're and yeah, programming they, our brains. They're programming so, our brains. So they're, yeah. we're we're using those tools <laughs> to program our our brains in some way. It's sort of like uh, suburban kids going to see a movie Cracks that's kind of it. Yeah. mimicking something that a director had an authentic experience once upon a time, tried to recreate it in a movie, and then someone goes to see that movie, and then that person, it's like this sort of numbed down and dumbed down kind of yeah. attempt at regurgitating something real. And then, Which will it will and the more you go into it, the less authentic it becomes. And what happens? Uh, a friend of mine uh, runs a kind of a twelve-step group of people in recovery, 
And he says, look, when you have lost eye contact, and this is a, a in, in the next podcast, I've got this piece called Conversation with the Madre coming out with the mother. And this is through a experience in the, in the jungle. Uh, but my theory is, and this is sort of, this is a, almost a McKenna-like prognostication that you choose to believe or not, that it's mother... It's Irish DNA, by the way. Yeah, there we are. <laughs> That's what yes. I, I have to own this now. The Barney... <laughs> He's programmed to see <laughs> And now I've, I've got full permission to shoot the Blarney. <laughs> well, the, the and credentials to carrying. back it up. <laughs> the shite and the shinola. Um, but the, uh, here's the theory, and this will be in the conversation with Madre, which will, might be out next week, uh, which is an hour long, it's worth listening, pounding through, it was massively edited. So the Madre is nature. And the, the nature, think of it as like the vine that's climbing in the jungle and it's trying to climb toward the, the, you know, the celestial sphere. These plants and all of nature's trend has been to push into new frontiers. And it just happens to have co-opted this monkey that will carry it into the solar system. You know, if, if life has any consciousness or power, there, there is a Gaia, it has one objective, which is to persist. So you'd think, well, we can't really communicate with Gaia, but Gaia certainly doesn't want to go the heat death sun thing, which is going to happen in several billion years. The sun's going to become a red giant, and the Earth is going to deorbit into the corona and break up. And pieces of the crust will go off, and they'll have bacteria in them. That's fine, and they can go back into the, the green belt in the galaxy. That's all very fine, but all the... All the complexity of the big stuff will be gone because the oceans will have boiled off a long time ago. Bacteria won't even know. This is the funny thing. The, the crustal bacteria, as the earth breaks up, the surface bacteria will say, hey, you know, crust is breaking off and there's big chunks of mountains and things like that. And their surface bacteria are finally able to see the, the five mile down bacteria. And they're saying, hey, uh, hey guys, uh, you won't believe what just happened. There was all this big life. There were oceans, there were huge things that did all this stuff, and there was an intelligent thing for a while, and there were jungles, and they'll say, you're kidding, this was going on? <laughs> you know, wow. no one told us, you know, that <laughs> off they go. But, so if life is anything, it wants to persist. So it finds any energetic avenue it can to persist, and we're it. And Madri doesn't care if we're trashing the place as long as we allow life to go out. And so, and this is my conversation with the Madre. Madre had a surprise. Madre had to make us manic to do this. So there was a branch, there was the primates, they're, they're in the trees, they're eating, they're getting high on sugars and they're doing all this, they're kind of nuts. But they branch out into primates, monkeys, all these kinds of things. But there's various branches like bonobos, which are very peaceable. And then there's orangs, which are very peaceable, and gorillas, very peaceable. And then there's chimpanzees, which are nutcases. And we're sort of branched off a similar, we're branched off after the bonobo, but before the chimp. So we've got the hippie thing of bonobo, peace and love, but we've got a total madness of the chimps can, can manifest too. Chimps have wars and things like that. It was discovered to the horror primatologist that chimps murder and you know, southern groups and northern groups in, in Gombe, in, in Central Africa. So we have enough mania that we can build technology. If we were bonobos, we wouldn't build even a bus system. <laughs> you know, we... <laughs> why? <laughs> you know, we're fine. We, co we copulate to resolve problems. <laughs> no. Terrible way to go. Terrible way to go. Bonobos just eat and lie around and sleep, and if there's a problem, they have sex. To the solve the problem. Yeah, the shiftless layabouts. And so Madre was never going to get the goods from that line. So, of course, we burst through the wiggle onto the planet and uh, we're building the scaffolding. We're doing all the things that carry life into different places. We carry life all around the planet. You know, in ship bilges, we spread life, we spread invasive species everywhere. We're like, fantastic mechanisms for evolution. We're driving evolution. We are just rocking. It's like 
culture and greed and you know madness and thermonuclear warheads and all these sorts of things leading to spacecraft but we're but we're not are we actually evolving at a biological level or or we're is this faster. evolution like an, at an artificial we're, so-called artificial we're, level we're hyper and now we're hyper evolving through culture and we're but we're hyper driving nature as well nature's evolving faster uh-huh. because it's got more pressure on it more selection pressure. And this is all happening at a time when something like nearly 100% of all species of biological life have vaporized from the planet. Yeah, pretty much. And then we're mm-hmm. vaporizing the rest. But, <laughs> but the thing, the thing we're is... We're simultaneously vaporizing it and advancing it? And advancing it very fast. Uh-huh. So, so, so we're chewing it up as fast as we're... Yeah, and, and which and is they, producing a whole so, other wiggle. <laughs> so it picks up on that and says, "Whoa, look what's happening! We better learn how to adapt." So which it's is causing the evolution. Yeah, it's causing and that evolution. evolution. It's an engine. It's an to engine. Drive. It's an engine for evolution. Yeah. And Madre, I so I asked the Madre. I said, "Do you mind that we're like I was in the rainforest, <laughs> and and a few hundred feet away, the loggers had cut." everything down and there was an illegal sluice operation going on <laughs> and and i was like more mercury. look at all the pollution and you know just amazing they're pumping uh water from these amazon tributaries through to get gold and then there was there was this fantastic original you know old growth tree and you look down at the soils and they're ter- tremendously poor the soils have no nutritive value in them because it's all locked up in, in these canopies. And as soon as they cut them down, the, the whole place goes to desert practically. It's incredible. Mm. So I said to Madre, do you mind that we're trashing the place? We're wiping out the biodiversity. And the, the answer came back, no, as long as the objective is met, the persistence of life, because you are the la- maybe the last chance, because the planet's past middle age now. So the continents, which... In the Devonian, that was the great era of the plants. And there were forests from Antarctica. There were forests from pole to pole. The plants were in their peak. And this is largely before animal, big animal populations, the Devonian period. And then there's the Carboniferous, which gave us coal. And it's all plants. So the plants like had this huge peak 300 million years ago, 250 million years ago. And, and the, the continents were able to peak out and they were in optimal positions, and now we're in deserts. We have desert belt, heat belts. We've got glaciation. It's it's, you know, it's clotted arteries, and it's uh, it's messed up because the 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 planet's biodiversity is running down. Its bioengine's running down. It won't be able to sustain what it used to be able to do. So, what is Madre's goal? So, if if Madre's goal, and this is all mythology, of course, <laughs> if Madre's goal is to get the get another who's copy. Madre, excuse me, who's Madre? Madre is nature. Gaia. Nature, oh, okay. the life force, the collective. Oh, okay. So Madre says, um, I feel old in my bones. Um, and there's this shot. There's this shot of this this manic monkey which can build scaffolding. So think of the vines that are climbing the rainforest trees. We cut those rainforest trees down and those vines have no chance to get up. But we're building scaffolding to the sky, we're building, we're churning biodiversity, and we're sending spacecraft out. And my friends at, at JPL, one of them said, if you landed on Mars, and right next to one of the rovers, the three rovers moving on the surface, and you had a screw gun, and you went over to one of them, you could drop the belly pan off the bottom, <laughs> you know, pick the one that we've discontinued, there's one of the ones that had a bum wheel and everything. And if you looked inside, you'd see basically bacteria coating the inside of the vehicle that survived the clean room, the vacuum chamber, everything, and the whole ride to Mars. Anything that was on the outside is wiped out by radiation. But on the inside, there's a dozen strains of bacteria, and these are full-on Terran bacteria, big machines as far as life is concerned. So I, in this, in this recounting, I took the Madre to Mars. And we did just that. I had her sitting over there, and I said, I'm going to show you that the manic monkey has brought life here. It is possible. But that you have a competitor. You have something that has risen that you didn't predict, which was technology and the matrix of technology. 
the monkeys have gotten sucked into. And the example being, we're all looking at phones, and the primal network of, of, of energy and of consciousness is eye contact. And if you've been in groups like, you know, 12 step or any kind of a group or a sweat lodge or whatever, where you have profound eye contact with people for a long period of time, you feel that power is unbelievable. I did a weekend where I looked into the eyes of 30 men. And, and there was one point where, at the end, we were all very close because we'd done all this stuff together, and, and we would just move a, a row of, from man to man. And this is done in a lot of yoga practices, too. And you look into the eyes of the next man, it's a whole different universe there. And you have to instantly respond to the universe, and they respond to you as the universe, and you come out at the end, and you're just, I mean, you're in an altered state. And so that mechanism is being basically captured by technology. So nature's primary mechanism for the empowering of all of this and of the human human conscious evolution is being cut off by tech. And tech is using that eye gaze to build its network. And it's sucking in all that attention span, dissolving all those eyeballs. So what is the goal of tech then? So tech is, is an emergent phenomenon. It's a, very much a junior to Gaia, to Madre, but it's, all, it's of the same type as Madre. It's an emergent phenomenon. It's like a slime mold. You know, slime molds are these self-organizing groups of single-celled things that can come together, chemically communicate, and create structures, fruiting bodies and, and complex structures. Bacteria do the same thing, and so that that's Madre's primary organizing mechanism at the lowest level in the soils, in the oceans. Tech behaves like a slime mold, but it's using mines as its primary feeding mechanism. But it's not a living thing. It's not even close. It's still very, very primitive and very ridiculous. It can be broken. So my ways. computer feeds off my mind like mold would on a, yeah, something you've got laying out on the, the counter. The network does. The network doesn't have the good design of a living system. It has some of the properties, but it's the only thing that's ever risen to compete with nature. These these uh, German Jews who you spoke about who were responsible for the creation of this technology, was the way it operates the way you just described by design? Or... They had no it just, idea. It just happened because they that's had... just what happens on Earth and everything that happens on Earth is sort of subject to these... Yeah, it was, ways it was to these protocols. It's hard to see it. Like if you talk to Bob Taylor, who's at the end of this month going to get honored with a lifetime award for helping to create. Basically, he created the ARPANET, which created the Internet. Like, this guy's the, the creator of the world. We live in Bob Taylor's world. <laughs> if you're in a laptop computer or using a mouse and an icon, using Ethernet and Internet and stuff, that's Bob Taylor's world. Excuse me. What, what did you say again? Say to him today? What is the name for your uh, nature? I call it Madre, the mother. Yeah. Oh, Madre. Madre. Uh, yeah. So when you you said you have a conversation with Madre, or yeah, I had a. You are you meditating? I was meditating. I was meditative state. So do you see it as a person, as a a being? A being. It's hard to say. I've had this conversation several times. Uh -huh. I was on an airplane having nothing more than really bad coffee, put on my headphones and boom, I'll go into these states. So so there is all of a certain a conversation with whatever. Well you start information coming into you. Like a felt presence. It's you, a felt you, presence and then you, you I have a flash and I'm in a space. A visual image. A, yeah, I'm in a visual image and I was traveling mm -hmm. through space to the moon. And I've done this for 10 years for NASA. I, I did 25 projects for NASA, including designing missions to the asteroids that now are the, I've just heard today on the news again, it's their objective. But I did the first design of how to take a human spacecraft, dock it to an asteroid and do operations. <laughs> and they used our image in the uh, story on NBC. Very cool. So, yeah. so you are uh, at various times, all of a certain boom, there's this connection. I'm in that world. And oh, you live in that? I'm, yeah, the world just manifests. Oh, and then yeah. I go with it. So and, and 
Oh, you have certain times. Spontaneous it occurs spontaneously. Spontaneously it, and it, unpredictably. You pretty much have to be, and you you can't sort of be at your computer; it'll never happen. But if you're uh -huh. in a quiet, <laughs> because you're being, your mind is being yeah. fed on she by the slime mold. mold. Yeah, the slime mold. Yeah. So, and does she have a personality? The, in she your does. Mind? She does. Can you explain a little bit? I mean, could you, if you would say, "Listen, I want to introduce you to Madre," what would you uh, first uh, most? Uh, I've right. seen I've seen her in a state of complete despair. Oh, there is emotion feelings. Yeah, in Peru, for example, I saw her and I saw her brood, which was these flaming reactors. I was in this space in Peru, and you I mean, traveled. I mean, on a on a elevated mind. elevated mind. Space. Oh, elevated mind. Oh, okay. Because when you work with shamans down there and the music and. Ten, it was ten days of of work with shamans and musicians and all kinds of things, and that puts you into that space. And in fact, this is why I think that Terence is wrong about the stoned ape theory. Uh -huh. He's completely wrong because the the rainforest itself is so powerfully stimulating. When you're in the rainforest and there's a full moon and there's twenty billion insects around you making sounds and there's twenty million amphibians frogs and there's all species of birds <laughs> and there's there's you know leopards and jaguars you know and the moon is shining down on all these plants that that's a hyper driven in fact i stood up at one point and i was dancing in the forest and i said this is the highest tech experience i have ever had this is so astounding the stimulation, the sounds, and the weirdness of these birds. And at one point, I remember, middle of the night, I, I went out, I was dancing into the forest, and I asked the forest to send its spirits out. You know, I, I had asked it to be called forth. And I realized I I kind of had, you know, pooped on myself in a way. And I disrespected the, the very power of this. The power of this was so much bigger than me. And I started walking back toward the hut, and this thing came rocketing out of nowhere. And this white sort of thing, big, and mm -hmm. went around my head three times, and I I was going to swat it away. And then, of course, you know, you just, no, 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 this is, don't do anything that you would normally do. And this, this thing came right in front of my eyes, and it had two black eyes. Mm -hmm. and it was a huge moth, and off it went. Mm -hmm. The force has just checked me out. Who is this dude <laughs> who called us? And I asked the shaman, I said, is this the eyes of the forest? And the shaman didn't answer. The good shamans never, they'll never answer. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they, don't want to, they don't want to go on the record. Uh, that's right. <laughs> so, uh, and so, she, she expressed dismay of this destruction or whatever. Yeah, so I closed my eyes and I went in during... Uh -huh. Well, these these night sessions, and I was transported into the shaman. Actually, dragged me out into the center of the room mm -hmm. during this thing. And I, at one point, I came to, and they were blowing smoke down my shirt. So I thought, well, that, thank you very much for <laughs> doing this. But I was then I became a spacecraft. I became all shapes. I could experiment because I was in this black void. And sometimes black boys are terrifying, but this one was not. It was like, oh, time to play. Uh -huh. And I could be any shape. So I, I gathered together all these geometric shapes and huge shapes, and I became being after being after being. But then I realized I'm in a tractor beam because the blackness around me is getting bluer and bluer. And it was the same blue that I saw in a butterfly called a blue morpho. When I arrived in Peru, this butterfly came and landed right at the step of my little hut and it was there for an hour till I noticed it and then I started to look around it and it was dancing around. I asked permission, took a flash picture and it showed all these patterns and then it opened its wings and it was pure metallic blue. These are some of the greatest butterflies for collectors in the world and it basically was telling me you could see all the patterns but you could, in the rare instance, go into this pure power where there's no patterns, there's no, you know, 
dancing elves, there's no, you know, those type of visions, it's just pure power. And I realized on the way up to the space, I'm going into the pure power. Yeah, you're not just experiencing it as a visual image, you are becoming yeah, it. Yeah, and it is tractor beaming you into this zone, and part of me is a little bit worried, but part of me was, you know, okay, we're dancing into the realm. And, but then, as I was being tractor beamed, I saw in the distance these glowing blobs. So I danced up to the glowing blobs, like, hi, glowing blobs, you know. And, and the voice came into my mind, you know, kid, you've never been here before. You, you've never been to this space. Be, be careful. Step back from the microphone, you know, just be prudent. <laughs> <laughs> And then she came out from behind them. She came out. Yeah, she came out. And she was this writhing, serpentine, multi-armed thing with a fantastic face. And I, I looked up. It's almost like bird and snake. And I looked up. And this is archetypal in, in these shamanic worlds. I, look, I realized I can't look at her face. Because her face is so powerful, this is a face that can kill. It's just too powerful. You can't look in those eyes. So I said, "I'll dance around you." And what are you know what is going on? And but what I sensed from her was agony and anguish. And I looked back at these reactor cores. I said, "Ah, oh, that's what they are. They're the collective unconscious of humanity. That one over there is despair. That one's greed." that one's seduction and sexual power. And I, I saw these basically flares and, and uh, mm -hmm. stuff going between them, and the whole thing was a freaking mess. And she yeah. was there, it was her brood, and she was in a state of utter panic of what to do. This thing was getting worse. It was like the kindergarten out of control. I mean, it was just anguish. And she views it as her creation? Yeah, it's her world, it's her brood, and it's destroying itself. And so, I, as I was leaving, I left that space, and at one point, I was coming out and saying, well, I, I, this is all well and good to see this, but I came here to work on my own healing, mm -hmm. and I'm almost out of time, and what is there? And then the voice came, and, and the voice said, look into yourself. So I, I looked down, and I saw little kids, you know, these are kind of, little kids in a kindergarten, kind of upsetting little kids. One kid got up, went over and whacked another kid, and that little kid's face got red and started wailing. And then another kid came and whacked another little kid. And the voice said, that is you. It's the same thing. Wow. That was mind. Mind went and was strangling body. And I realized at that point, this is why I'm so busted and tired, because my mind which is overactive, as you can tell, <laughs> was strangling... You didn't say anything. <laughs> ...was strangling my body because I would stop breathing when I was at the computer, typing and thinking too much, and my body was starting to really suffer. And then my heart, my ego, would come and, and hurt my heart and make me do things. I said, this is an out-of-control kindergarten. There's nobody been in charge here for a long time. And I realized, but I'm separate from this kindergarten. And I could, in, in that state, I could command you, mind, go sit in the freaking corner, put on the dunce cap. And, and I said to Ego, I said, look what you're doing to that heart. And it actually it was taken aback. Mm -hmm. And suddenly the whole place got calm. And I was like, Wow, I just calmed down my own internal psychic kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So I kind of hung a, a sign up saying, you know, this place now under new management. Mm -hmm. You, mine, mm -hmm. cannot take the steering wheel of the bus and drive it. And for the next few days, it was like I could, I could sense when mind wanted to control my voice and say something, or ego wanted to do that. And heart wanted to come up and express, but couldn't because it was being pushed down. And, and I was under new management 
for that period. Now I had, I had nailed these guys. I had nailed them. And it was the same thing as Madre was having to deal with, but, but on a planetary scale. But it was, it was too concentrated. It was too intense. So I meditated for an entire day on this and said, how will I ever go back to that place? I, I'm, I'm, may I? Yes. It, it, at the same time, it seems to me that Madre is also saying, I'm okay with all of this as long as the goal is achieved. Mm. But simultaneously, kind of... The, the, the goal's in danger for well, her. Because of self-destruct. Self-destruct mode. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, like in, it's like in Andromeda Strain or you know, any like, Total Recall where someone just pushed the self-destruct button and it's like <laughs> counting down. So it would seem... It would seem that, <laughs> just push. So these, these protocols of this expanding and contracting process that's driving all of this... You know where it, where it just sort of shimmers into, you know, at a, at a subatomic level, and then coalesces back into form, and mm -hmm. is constantly flying to pieces, condensing, and, condensing back into form, expanding and contracting. Um, is is that's Madre's way? Isn't that's it? Madre's way. In fact, way I in my cosmology. So if Madre's always, way yeah. is this constant birth and annihilation process how can we expect i mean are we actually being attempting to create another way of doing things so we don't have to beat each other over over our head to drive evolution what you're describing is what you began by describing which is your dissertation in the wiggly line and the peaks and then suddenly it would saddle out mm -hmm. are we going to keep going or are we going to have a saddle here which is uh, I think, the question yeah i think that we are mm -hmm. we're at the cusp and this isn't, there's no, I'm not going to pick any date. <laughs> yeah, <that's, laughs> yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, I, I could make more money, you know, <laughs> if I picked a date. But yeah. Till the date came. Yeah, Till the date came. Always, uh, <laughs> you have to die so, before the yeah. date comes. <laughs> <laughs> 2066. <laughs> Madre is not going to give you dates. <laughs> Madre is not going to give dates. Well, back to sort of the she Madre. So in the conversation with Madre, sort of making it simple. Madre, I said to her, you have a competitor that you didn't count on, which is these, these sap-sucking <laughs> primates that are so addicted to their sugars and to also mesmerized by color mm -hmm. and you know, snake patterns have gotten s snookered by technology. They've snookered themselves. And now the, the technology machine that they are building is not a living form, there's no intelligence to it, but it's like a slime mold of mental slime mold it is growing and growing and growing and it's competing with evolution actually will it birth a new form of evolution or will it turn us all into plugged in androids you know incapable of anything as many science fiction writers write about or is it is it just climbing the ladder so the the answer can be found in younger people um some younger people have kind of become the zombie apocalypse, right? I mean, they're, they're in the zombie apocalypse and walking along like this. But some of them, they maximize their use of tech while they're so incredibly present in the world. Like, they are world citizens. They have bullshit detectors, so they don't believe any politics, any news story, anything like that. They're into permaculture and global culture and visionary seeking. Mm -hmm. And so there's this clump of human beings that isn't going to get destroyed by this. That's going to grow. They're actually being empowered. They're by being it. empowered by it. And they also do extreme sports. They also do, they do everything they know to give themselves balance. They're not victims. There are many, many victims. There will be many victims, but then there will be, as there is a chunk of victims, there will be a chunk of people who are the Olympians of this world. And so mm. reaching them, you know, and perhaps in the sixties, it was explorers. There was a, a fraction of the 60s that weren't victims. The <laughs> same as every decade. But in a way, they're like super beings. They're like the kids, you know, the indigo or whatever. Yeah. But they, they're they hyper capable. They can make a billion dollars in a year, you know, starting a, an app company, you know, at 16 years old. This is what they can do. And then they... they times, I, well, I just want to, yeah. at some point, interject. Is this a good point? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You were sharing your um, experience with um, Madre, and you went out and 
uh, all of a sudden there was a there was a leap in consciousness. So now there's new management in town. Right. Yeah, I love that because that totally yeah, it's it's that conscious created an evolution in you. I mean, I call it that. And I'm seeing that, like you said, the planet is stuck and she's got her brood. And there was this analogy that was being taught to you by her, is what I'm seeing. I'm, I'm just in, in, seeing this like, wow, because what I'm seeing is she has the same capability. She's stuck, she's a little, but it's that that's going to create this evolutionary leap, leap, which I believe are these children. Mm -hmm. I believe it's in us. Mm -hmm. That as you did your leap, uh, this luminous being, human, uh, what is it, homo luminous, that is like not by next generations, but within a generation, we're, we're creating the new consciousness that is creating the leap creating of the this life. being that is no longer part of that old soup. That is going to help shift that. Yeah, I don't you're know, that you're I'm seeing like, it. You're, you're, you're verbalizing it beautifully. Yeah. Yeah. I just, it just, I just saw the, saw those connect and went. It's here. It's, it's already here. here. We are shifting it already. At the beginning of the talk, when I was talking about how do you see the face of God, if we understand now the mechanism, can you imagine? the people who come through that portal and survive the ego thing and survive the, the media thing and survive anxiety and burnout and all that and, and navigate past it and, and they work on themselves and they have practices and they also are able to access that power that they realize their brain and the pathways in their brain through stilling the mind and other practices they can manifest a universe in their mind with, without dying or something like that but they can then contact that, they can power that up. Mm -hmm. And when you power that up, it's like a beacon to everything. Because if a few people power that thing up, and they realize, oh, I'm seeing the whole a, a, a rendition of the universe. Like when I saw that, what happened was I, I was up at the doorway, and this is the most powerful experience I've ever had, more potent but more enigmatic than meeting the Madre and her brood. This opening occurred, I looked up into the sky from the trees and suddenly this hissing sound occurred and then this pattern started and it was basically, it's time. You know, we all know inside that this, this could happen. In fact, it would happen when we die, maybe. It's time to be revealed the full thing. You know, you're meeting your maker or you're, or this is everything. This is it. And it's the opening begins. And what I did at that point, I was so surprised by this this opening that started because it took over everything. I, I asked two questions. I said, is this death? And the answer was, there's no concept. That's, that's, a, that's no concept of death here. There's no time here. And this complete ball then formed. And then there was no forest or trees or anything left. It was this complete ball. And then I asked the question, well, what about all the the automobiles and the, the mathematics and the, you know, they said, no, this is the core. This is underneath. Everything else is just reflections off of this. This is the whole thing. And, and I, I, I then broke the, broke the connection because I turned to a friend of mine with my eyes and like, you got to see this thing. <laughs> Look at this thing. And I looked into his eyes and his eyes were dilated or they sort of anti-dilated out into full blue and for the next day he was totally trashed I mean, he's out he's on his backside i mean this, this was just this was not helpful which was said later it's <laughs> not helpful <laughs> so i didn't i didn't come to that point where you surrender to the opening when you surrender to the opening you go into what's called a non-dual state people have talked about this throughout the ages and, and I'm hoping to go back there at some in, point. In the non-dual state, state, you're actually setting aside the extant protocols of expansion and contraction and being a participant in helping to drive the engine. Yeah. You're basically just saying, I'm going to idle here. Yeah. I'm going to put it in neutral and just kind of coast. And you're, and no, uh, you're no longer the separate. moderate doesn't does or does not like that. <laughs> well, I think, so how does this all, <laughs> yeah, how does this all connect? We're all living separately, so for that instant when you're 
when you die or when you uh, when you do surrender to the ball and the energy comes through you and blasts you apart, you know, blasts all resistance away, and you come out somehow transformed. But what is that? You know, is the madre in there? Well, the question I ask is, is no. That, that this thing is underneath everything. It, it's a little bit disturbing to me to think that the the force of Gaia or Madre is the most happening thing on the planet. Not not a presence that I would expect is sitting around worrying about things. I would expect that that Jeez. underlying force. It's sort of like, you know, if, if the native, if, if, if Aboriginal culture in North America was so hot, what happened? You know, right. it's sort of like that notion, you know. Oh my God, she has problems too. I gotta get out of here. <laughs> Yes, right, right. And, and so it's sort of like, well, I mean, is someone, someone, but, something, uh, some yeah, organization I, sitting around, not like you not, know, <laughs> with knitted brows, yeah, being brow. very deeply concerned yeah, I, I, about I, 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 what's I, I, going on I, 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 here. There might be a way to connect with us, you know. There's oh, something because right, they're just pretending to sort of be upset to get our attention. <laughs> well, if, you, if they are in total uh, in control and in power they can say anything they want, you know, and nothing right. disturbs. So we're just team. projecting our own anxiety on I mean, that them. might, uh, you know, it yeah. might be a connection, you know, because uh, this is a total new experience. You don't know what the but, hell is going on. But, listen, you might have, there might be a, a the one reason why she pretends. I, I right. have but it may be that pretends. the madre has, yeah, a, right. has her own mother. You know, this is the line. The madre yeah. is an offspring of this power. Which is the wiggle, actually. But it's the collective wiggle. So the Madre is, is an offspring, a powerful offspring, but a precocious one. And one that doesn't have all the answers. One that strives, like any life form. Sort of, sort of middle management, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's, she's a connector. She's the connector between the wiggle, the giant wiggle, and um, the birth of the conscious entity. She birthed us. And we then birthed tech, and it sort of goes on down down the line. But it's all supposed to add up to something. Uh huh. It adds so, up to. Yeah, <laughs> I, I want to meet who's writing the checks here. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, I mean, like you yeah. said, you wanted to you wanted to see that. Well, I believe I, here's, I think I heard you say a, that. Here's a guess. It, that's sort of all hell broke loose for me. Here's a guess. Uh -huh. The audacious little force that said, "I'm going to create uh, something that's." deterministic in the universe. So you have this perfect void we, we talked about in the beginning of this quantum dynamical field that has perfection, it has no time, it has no predictability, it's just totally mellow and goes on and on and on. <laughs> but the, the, the joker force that said, I'm going to upset this by creating predictability, that force, that cosmic joke, <laughs> is a very powerful thing. That's the coalescence into form. Trickster. That's really the coalescence that. into form, mm -hmm. and it's a trickster in some ways, but it's really powerful. And, and what it did by saying, this point in space is going to be there in the next instant. Because predictability really only, I mean, you have to wrestle with the thing extensively just to maintain even a small degree of predictability, which is kind of what we're doing. Because the predictability is really a sort of a, it's a very temporary state of delusion because the thing's about to fly to pieces. About to fly to in pieces. Moment. And it's being forced because the universe is trying to get rid of that predictability. And that's called chaos or entropy or mm -hmm. decay or constantly trying to shuck that off, to, mm -hmm. to, to buck that off. So it's the right and the left, sort of like yeah, <laughs> creating the, this engine that's driving. It's a duality. Mm -hmm. But what happened... I think that what you what you could see, or maybe what I saw, was the collective roar of that thing saying, I will persist despite your attempts to shuck me off. And I did it from the first wiggle, and I made stars, and I made compounds, and, you know, fuck off. I'm going to persist. And it's this, this roar of this order and complexity against this thing that is trying to pull it apart and return to 
the rest state, and the rest state is a, a random clock fluctuating quantum dynamical field with nothing going on. That's it's the rest the, state. It's the absence of time. And the absence of time. time. So wouldn't time then be a constraint? Isn't the randomly fluctuating quantum mechanical field, isn't that, isn't that a greater thing? Time would be a lens on yeah, Time is a lens on And t time's an artifact of this, this roaring thing that said, I'm imposing time upon you so that I can persist. I can express persistence against this simplicity. So I can express complexity. And life is another stage of that. So the Madre, you know, her homage is actually to the wiggle. And the, when, you, when your brain stops and all the particles flowing through your brain suddenly have choice and the, the Feynman histories bloom and the Feynman histories bloom along the pathways of your neurons, which outnumber the particles in the universe, suddenly your brain is this lens on the whole thing. And so what you see when the face of God comes or death comes, you actually contact the whole thing. So that, that was the, the two days, so I had the experience, and two days later I was like, that's how it works. That's Would you call how, that state, um, what you're talking about, the, the ex explosion, is ecstatic bliss? I mean, because I've experienced that, and it's like, I'm, I'm all. Yeah, it's that. So, I mean, this is what yogis are, you know, doing. Exactly. It's like, and but the, it's temporary. But, I mean, for us to access yeah, at, at times. But, at times. Or it's, but it's accessible. You're putting yourself into opposition with powerful forces that, that really want to usurp that your achieving of that state, right? I mean, there, there's no rest there um, in that yeah. place, are you? Is there any theory around where both could live happily <laughs> next to each other, <laughs> order, time, and the randomness? Yeah. I think, I, I I think, think the corporate time. That's what it seems like to me. The corporate time, but the, the, what is perfecting that is life. It's perfecting a middle ground. So in some sense, the universe is going, ah, well, I was fighting, the universe was a big fighting force, and then suddenly this thing came in, which is able to use entropy to create persistence against all odds, and to create novelty, and to create completely bizarre new creations. So the universe is like, what is that? It, it's a totally new thing. So in culture, uh, I wrote a chapter for a book that was published on Darwin's birthday, and, and, and the chapter was called Building the God Detector. And so the question I asked, and this is about, you know, where do you find God? Would God exist in the universe of pure physics where there's just collapsing stars? And everything? No, because nothing can be done. There's no, no ability to influence that universe. It's all just laws of physics. So God, therefore, only exists in the universe where life is. And therefore, what can God actually do? to change the future. The place where the future is made is when codes are copied. So a baby's born because, you know, sperm and egg yeah. get together. Or when a monk is transcribing the Aramaic version of the Bible and makes a mistake where he says, and the young virgin, well, all right, virgin in Greek, because I don't understand the Aramaic term, which actually is just young woman. So he translates it to virgin, and the older monk comes by and says, that's wrong, you don't understand your Aramaic, that just means girl. And he said, well, I wrote it as virgin, and what do you want to do, tear up the whole thing and start again? And the older monk says, well, wait a minute. A lot of religious traditions that compete with us use virgin birth as their, as one of their, you know, come to our service because we'll tell you about virgin births. And, the crowds line up, and so you leave it in, you know, uh, sounds good. <laughs> so, yeah. so then you get the myth of the virgin birth, and then whole things come out of that. So God can only actually operate where strings are copied into other strings. So I called it God and the copying rule. And then you break it down even further, and you say, okay, is, is God the random change, like from young girl to virgin in Greek? And and the mutation of 
that gene, that's how God actually operates and, and makes the future? And, and the answer was like, not really, because it's so random. If God was then driving all randomness, then God would have to be the entire universe because random things are all connected and they, it doesn't make sense. I concluded at the end of the chapter that God was adaptation to the copying errors. So God was evolution. God was natural selection, actually. But it was, that was the answer, that what is God is. So God's the same as Darwinian natural selection, the process of creation. So that was one of the <laughs> one little data right. point. So when the so the people who are fighting it out over this or that are just falling into the sort of denser protocols of expansion and contraction and missing the point entirely that it's it's not either or it's and or it's and or <laughs> and life. So if the universe breathes in order when a star forms and and particles come in. It creates order for a period of time. Then when the star blows out, blows up, it breathes out disorder. But in that process of a supernova explosion, heavy elements are formed. So it's more complex. It's called a ratchet. So that the ratchet goes to the next level and the next level. So despite the expansion contraction, complexity is made. And then life in the middle mm -hmm. handles both. It can breathe in. We breathe in and make order. And we breathe out and make chaos. And as a species... We're breathing in and creating McDonald's and highways and, you know, burning up jet fuel and financial systems. And we're creating all this order. And then we do something crazy and we blow it up. And we blow up the financial system and we destroy vast areas of continents for agriculture in the future and wipe out species and do the chaos thing and bring ourselves to the edge of extinction. We're doing that process. But... As we do it, we ratchet up. And this is, I think, the madre climbing, or the wiggle is ever climbing through chaos, disorder, order. But li life, life uses both. It uses order and persistence and chaos. So it's a, that's why it's a new physics. And so the, the climb goes on. So in a sense, the brain which, if my wacky idea is right, that can see the whole, can be the, you can be in the non-dual state even for an instant. That's the first time our species or any species, maybe cetaceans have been doing it for 10 million years, and, and they're that's just laughing. They <laughs> that's all they do. But So <laughs> we've reached this point where if the whole universe was looking, across the earth it would see a little flashes of light like somebody putting a cigarette lighter on for a second and what it would be is unity total unity would be occurring all over the planet here and here just a little bit of here and one there and one there and one there and so you take the whole planet over the history of humankind and what's occurring is <clears throat> is the unity of the whole manifesting the entire quantum state of the universe can be seen for an instant inside a biological mechanism that is the embodiment of the madre and technology uh, inside of a matrix. As people have time, they don't have to hunt, or hunt gather all the time, so technology allowed those little flashes to start occurring. So, you know, in children or whatever, and more and more flashes are occurring and it's, it's somehow, this is going somewhere, right? I don't know where I'm going with this, but somehow um, it's, a high, it's a high point in the history of the universe. It's a real high point. So there's a lot at stake here. It's not just, you know, wiggly things climbing out of planets and living on other, other planets and surviving. It's universal. it's universal. So does that mean the mothership is finally going to pull into orbit and say... You guys passed, you know, and here's your card for membership. In, <laughs> you can join at the level, the level G. Yeah. Turn off the time generator. Right. Turn off the time generator. Yeah, turn off the big movie. Yeah. The big movie camera okay. stops. All right, you can be everywhere at once now. That's right. I, I think that what aliens will do, aliens, because they know we're sucker primate, although, oh, it's binocular vision thing. All right. 
set up the screens, and it will set up this, this belt of, of high density, 100 mile or 1,000 mile high screens around the earth in a ribbon, and it will be advertising. It will be, yeah, we'll be looking up, and there will be ads running for like alien cars and trips. <laughs> and you'll put your ad here, and you know, huge Google searches will be going and we'll be looking <laughs> and, and we'll be part of their matrix. That's what will happen. So, where do we go from here? Are those little flashes manifesting a rendering of the universe? And if they are, do they create some kind of meta-awareness of the whole from inside or from outside? Thanks to Mystical Sun for his musical introduction, Nebulous Mist, from his album Primordial Atmospheres. This and other episodes of Dr. Bruce are available for remixing for your own projects under our Creative Commons 3.0 non-commercial share-alike license. Find this and images, video, writing, and commentary on these themes at www.drbruce.org.